And we're live. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. This is early morning on Pacific Coast, <laughs> and it's mid morning on East Coast where I am, and hopefully afternoon in Europe. So, for everyone who is watching us, maybe we have someone from India, maybe we have someone from Midwest. Everybody, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. This is Irene Lakovetsky, and I'm hosting another NAPS event today. So, while people are gathering, I would like to introduce, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker today, because it's my pleasure to host Dieter Matzion. Dieter, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me here. Pleasure is mine, and the pleasure is absolutely on everybody's behalf, on NAPS audience, because Dieter, you are a FinApps uh, practitioner. Yes. You are an, ad an ambassador. That's and true. you are an author with O'Reilly Media Series. This is something. You are YouTube creator, Dieter. And this is all about FinApps discipline, adaption, and practical advices for larger community, Dieter. Again, we're so privileged to have you on today. Why don't we get started? Absolutely. Fin Thank you for having me. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely, Dieter. So FinApps, right? So many people already know about this discipline. Why the developers, why engineers or finance people should know about what FinApps is? Can you quickly summarize and we dive into some practical practical points we announced today? Yeah, absolutely. So not many people know, right? They think FinOps is financial operations. That's actually not correct. Uh, FinOps <laughs> is no of finance and DevOps, right? Uh, stressing the communication and collaboration between business and engineering teams, right? Uh, FinOps is an evolving cloud financial management discipline and, uh, and a cultural practice that enables organizations to get maximum business value by helping engineers, finance, technology, and business teams to collaborate on a data-driven spent decisions. That's a mouthful. That's a <laughs> mouthful. Let's dissect it, Leah. Let us, let's dissect it, Dieter, because with your experience, you've been working um, with FinOps discipline and tools on Netflix, Google, correct me, correct me here on your background, Dieter, so we Absolutely. kind of raise your profile for our audience first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correctly. Uh, I have been doing, uh, well, it was back then called Cloud Financial Management since 2013, right? Um, at Google, Netflix, Intuit, and uh, currently at Roku. So um, I started actually at Google where um, they hired me to find inefficiencies in their internal cloud offerings, right? These inefficiencies can then be taken and moved into their public cloud offering. Um, and so this is where I learned cloud from the ground up, right? How it works, um, you know, how all the components are, how to take services and move them. Um, that was necessary because Google back then was growing more than they anticipated. And the, um, you know, building a data center, it takes about two years, right? So it's a, it's a long uh, time before you have new capacity available. Um, so they needed someone to, to find inefficiencies. And then when I moved to Netflix, I basically learned uh, Amazon Web Services from the ground up, and I continued doing the same type of work. Beautiful. Then you are just the right person to answer some of the practical questions. So let me speak to our audience for a moment. Again, thank you so very much for taking your time, maybe before your work day, maybe during your work day, maybe just after your work day. Absolutely. Please let us know where, where are you joining from? What kind of FinApps experience you have, if any? Okay, any questions for Dieter while we're speaking, because I'm sure some of the points will resonate with you. So let us know that you're interested in the topic and simply that it's resonating, what we're discussing here. So Dieter, back to you here. Yeah, uh, FinApps, you mentioned your experience, okay? More and more I see jobs for FinApps practitioners out there. Can you maybe spill out what do people do when they have FinApps in their title? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Cloud FinOps Practitioners, um, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, we only have two levers that we can pull, right? We have um, uh, uh, rate optimization and usage optimization. So rate optimization are things like uh, enterprise discounts, uh, private rate cards, um, reservations, reserved instances, savings plans, committed usage discounts, uh, those kind of things. And then the uh, usage optimization, um, while we can surface it 
centrally. It has to be done decentralized by the engineering teams. And so this is what I want to emphasize in this, in this call. Rate optimization can uh, almost exclusively be done uh, centrally by, by just one person or a small team, right? Uh, for example, if you're ne renegotiating a, a very large contract with a large cloud vendor, you may want a couple of people to help you with that, maybe someone from finance and so forth, right? But it's essentially a very small group of people that can do that. Um, however, usage optimization are things like right-sizing, re-architecting, cloud parking, uh, using more cloud-native services, um, going to like serverless and those kind of things, right? Um, the, the recommendations can be surfaced centrally, but the execution or the, the deliverable of those uh, recommendations has to be done decentralized with the uh, engineering teams. Um, so each engineer is uh, most familiar with the workloads, right? And they, um, they have intimate knowledge about it. Um, I'm just one FinOps person and uh, you know there's 2,500 engineers or 3,500 engineers. So over time, I will build more knowledge, but ultimately I can't have that detailed knowledge with each individual in the engineering team, what their workloads look like, uh, how they're spiking, you know, what their needs are for batch processing and so forth. So we do need the help of engineers to um, you know, step step in and and look at those recommendations and act upon them. Yes, that sounds easy, Dieter. Or you make it sound easy, right? So, um, can you explain to us then uh, engineers and their accountability? All right, because we're talking about um, rate optimization and cost optimization. So before optimization, what about visibility first, right? Because you need to see what you're optimizing. So what's your take on this? Where to start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, cost visibility in the cloud is is the the first thing that you do in your cloud uh, FinOps journey, right? Ideally, you want near real time cost visibility. Um, because when an engineer starts an experiment and the experiment is, you know, is live, they, they want to go and look at um, how did the experiment perform, right? How much did it cost? What is, what is the latency? What is the customer experience, right? Uh, what are all those parameters? So uh, cloud costs should be um, made available to engineers in near real time. Now, to be able to have cloud cost in any useful manner, uh, because let's say you have an account or a subscription or a project on the GCP side, um, there may be multiple workloads running in this, right? You may have a, a mobile front end, you may have a database in the back end, you may have some software in the middle that does something, right, that, that uh, gives you a competitive advantage. Um, so for, for these kinds of situations, you need tagging to or, or labeling on the, you know, depending if it's in a containerized workload, right? You need tagging to help you out so that you really can say, okay, this engineer has started this workload. This is the new workload. This is different from the old one. And we want to see um, what the cost implications are of, of that workload. So it's not just vi um, important to have the visibility into the uh, financial um, aspects of your cloud workload, but it's also important for anomaly detection, right? Ever so often it happens that uh, an engineer does an experiment, they, they turn something on before it was supposed to be scheduled to be on, and there's now a cloud cost that we didn't anticipate, right? So for these cost anomaly detections, um, it's not really helpful when at the end of the month, I tell you that you spent $80,000 over budget, right? Um, all you can do then is just be sad. Um, it's much more useful if uh, an hour later uh, you get an email uh, that would be in a fully automated fashion, right? Saying like, hey, we saw a, a cost spike that will amount to $80,000 a month. Um, is that something that was intentional? This is helpful. Jitter, thank you very much. This is helpful. Why don't we dive into some of the important FinApps capabilities now? So I hear a lot about showbacks and chargebacks, okay? So people who may not be working with uh, FinApps discipline for as long as you you are, Dieter, people use it interchangeably. I know it's different. Can you spell it out for us? Chargebacks and showbacks. Of course. So the um, tags that we mentioned in or the labels that we mentioned earlier, right? they help with the cost attribution. So the very first, sort of like when you look at that from a crawl 
walk and run uh, maturity perspective, right? Um, and now to the FinOps Foundation is actually more and more using the pre-crawl. You don't do anything. How does this look like, right? So um, the probably a showback is more of a crawl or walk maturity where you uh, show engineers, hey, this is how much you have uh, uh, have spent, right? Uh, that then interconnects with budgets as well, right? Um, setting up a budget alert to let you know when your budget is, is in danger. Again, you don't want at the end of the month to get a, a notice, hey, I was 80,000 over. Uh, now all I can do is just be sad about it and, and be hopeful for the next month. But let's say that your growth um, is so much steeper that an algorithm can determine that by the end of the month, you will be um, 80,000 over, but it can determine that maybe five days into the month, right? So at that point, getting that budget alert is useful because now you can do something about it, right? Um, then uh, chargebacks is again, a, a different way of that accountability model, right? If each uh, budget owner has a, a budget set and then the cloud cost is being charged back to them, uh, they can then make uh, the best decisions on how to proceed. Let's say they want to roll out a new feature, but they don't have budget for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we uh, side by side um, show a waste dashboard with um, uh, opportunities to uh, reduce cloud cost, right? So now you have a new feature of, let's say, $80,000, but then you have a couple of, of waste reduction opportunities of 50,000, 20,000, 10,000. Now this, this person can make choices. They can say like, okay, if I want this feature uh, and I want to stay within budget, assuming, then I have these uh, savings opportunities here that I can um, uh, act on and, and share with my engineers. And um, you know, once we uh, have the savings, we can then roll out the, the feature in parallel. So on, on one side, it will go up and on the other one, it will go down, but your budget overall will be uh, not harmed. Uh, sounds again, sounds easy, sounds easy to keep in mind, but Dieter, let me probe you on something, okay? Engineers, they are living with innovation, okay? They don't mm -hmm. like to be disciplined, all right? I was an engineer early in my career. I know where, once you're on a project, right, you want to use all the resources possible and some more, okay? So where is this culture comes in place where, again, we want engineers to be innovative, but at the same time, yeah, to to have that uh, visibility and accountability in organization. And, and I have to caution anyone that is um, becoming too uh, procedural when it comes to uh, doing things in the cloud, right? The, the strength of the cloud is that you can run experiments that were impossible in, the da in a data center, right? If I need to run an, uh, a machine learning experiment that needs 100,000 cores for a couple of hours, uh, that is extremely difficult to do uh, in data centers, right? Uh, there are some known projects of protein folding uh, where a data center has been built and then handed over from the protein folding company to the government actually to do some communications. So there are some precedents for that, but it's usually uh, multi-year projects, right? Uh, we are looking at like four or five years for this entire thing, not four or five hours, right? So the 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 strength of the cloud is not to help you save money. A lot of people get that uh, perception wrong. Um, you know, when you compare apples to apples uh, in the in the cloud, um, someone else is carrying a pager and they will be notified if there is an outage, right? That person needs to be paid, and that person is not within your company anymore, right? So cloud on average will have a little bit of a premium because someone else is, is doing that kind of work, right? Maintenance patches, software updates, that kind of stuff. So the, the advantage of the cloud is really in that experimentation to be able to do a machine learning experiment or something similar like that, right? 100,000 cores for a couple of hours. If it turns out that it works fine, then uh, what you can do is you can think of how to uh, productize that experiment, right? Maybe from 100,000 cores, that's actually a true example that we did at Intuit. Um, we did a, a machine learning algorithm that on a receipt, uh, it finds where the total value of the receipt is. And surprisingly, it's not always the last value on the bottom right, because when you uh, buy uh, raw materials like lumber or something like that, there's some, some taxes that follow that number. 
uh, a breakdown of, of different uh, taxes. So that machine learning algorithm, the first proof of concept, uh, was uh, tens of thousands of cores, something like uh, 50, uh, 70,000 cores. But once we productize it, we brought it down uh, to uh, less than 900, like 880 cores, something like that, right? Um, and that was much more manageable from a cost perspective. So engineers are highly encouraged to experiment, uh, but that that responsibility, uh, that, that freedom comes with a responsibility, right? Um, you also need to monitor your cost and make sure that you're not over so for example when uh, in my experience when an experiment uh is unsuccessful the engineer will terminate ex that experiment as quickly as possible right they don't want anyone to see that but when the experiment is successful they keep it up and running for weeks on end and show it around to their friends so that their friends can take a look at it right meanwhile this thing is a hundred thousand cores and cost us like you know ten thousand dollars a day or something like that and uh this is where that you know freedom and responsibility um paradigm comes back it's also part of the netflix culture uh book by the way right that uh the engineers get that freedom uh but it comes with the responsibility that you need to act responsible right um, um and, and and that is a, a common theme so we we don't want under no circumstances do we want uh engineers to open tickets to um uh, start a new workload in the cloud right maybe for an architecture review that's okay but uh they can just go and experiment as much as they want and we don't want to constrain that because the outcome of those experiments, and I see a lot of new stuff that is possible in the cloud, like uh, bots, chatbots, and, and similar things that are very useful, that uh, building this technology in the data center it would be just a headache, and in the cloud, it's just a few mouse clicks and you're done, right? So under no circumstances do we want, we want guardrails, right? These guardrails, uh, if an engineer steps over, um, it, it uh, either lets them know, uh, a notification, right? You just started a service that is $5,000 an hour. Are you sure you wanted to do that, right? Uh, or we push them back from, from the guardrail. So it's a little bit like a rubber band, right? That the engineer runs into it, but we push them back and said like, you just started a virtual machine in the cloud that is $5 per hour. Usually the price is in single digit cents, right? So we terminated that instance, and here's why. Here's a uh, link to a confluence page that explains how to do that properly. And if you if you did that intentionally, here's the steps that you can follow to do that. So we want those guardrails in place uh, to let the engineers go on a paved road, uh, but you know we don't want them to uh, get hurt or them to hurt the company. Exactly. To hurt themselves without even realizing it. You know, those cloud exactly. cost mounts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of stories and anecdotes over there. Dieter, maybe you can feed us <laughs> with some of those, you know, where again, bad things happen. And it's, yeah, it's unintentional, but at the same time, you cannot stop innovating. So Dieter, maybe some of the examples from your work life of good stuff happening and maybe not so good stuff. Yes, uh, I'm very happy to share so um, I don't want to go into specifics at which company this was, but uh, we sometimes have interns, right? So um, it, it, we had the situation where an intern was told um, to go boil the ocean. You know, they, they did an elastic map reduce thing that was just phenomenally large. Uh, and unfortunately, the intern already knew how to do that. So they started a workload uh, that was several ten thousand uh, dollars a day, and we caught it within a couple of hours. Uh, then we used cost attribution to find out um, in in which team that workload was uh, started, right, created, and then we reached out to that manager. And the manager uh, initially uh, didn't know what was going on, and then he remembered, "Hey, I told this intern to go and boil the ocean." Um, Maybe he knows how to do that. And so we took a look. And within essentially 24 hours, uh, we were able to turn that off and bring that back in, right? So those things happen all the time. And um, I think that's OK, right? You want, you want those kind of situations. Another situation is, let's say, you do uh, uh, for blob storage or uh, Amazon's uh, simple storage service, um, you want to do a data lifecycle a policy that takes older objects and, and moves them to colder storage options, right? Because colder storage options are cheaper. 
So that is actually something that happened just recently. Um, you can uh, look at that on my LinkedIn feed, right? Uh, where the engineer went and uh, turned this on, everything that's older than 12 months gets moved to colder storage. Well, the problem is that, um, you know, you need some education too, right? You need to train the engineers. They need to know the effect of their actions. Uh, in this specific case, they were using two separate AWS products. Um, and if you transition data between two separate products, there's a transition fee. In this case, the transition fee was three cents per thousand objects. The engineer moved 3.3 billion objects. So that comes out to be $80,000, right? Um, and so you need to not only be allowed to experiment, but there is also a training component, right? Uh, from my perspective, what I have seen most useful is to get certified, right? This is why I'm a certified cloud financial uh, uh, FinOps practitioner and um, get certified because the certification will ensure that you have a, a minimum uh, set of knowledge, right? Um, and it will give you enough training that you may not know the answer to the question that you're looking for. However, by um, you will have enough knowledge that you will know that you have to research that. You, right? you can't just go and turn something on um, because there may be unknown side effects, right? So you will have at least that knowledge and be able to uh, act responsibly and, and uh, you know, do the right things for yourself and the company. Yeah, good point. Good point, Dieter. Knowledge is power, right? So the more and more FinApps discipline becomes, uh, more and more people aware of it, right? The certification, the need for that education, you know, will rise. And that's absolutely, that will help because it's not about the tool. It's about who is using the tool. How about that? So, yeah, yeah, good point. Um, now, let's go back a little bit maybe to forecasting because... Uh, I know it's important, right? It's important capability. And again, it's finance and engineers work together to forecast cloud spend, right? So they have a benchmark. How does it work? So forecasting, again, there's different methods, right? Between crawl, walk, and run. Um, uh, run, of course, may be a fully automated one. Uh, that's what we are doing uh, at my current employer, that the forecast essentially runs every day at 6.30 p.m., if there is uh, new input data, like uh, new projects, right? Uh, how th there is no machine learning algorithm that can detect that you are going in three months to start uh, providing a service in a new country, right? There is no machine learning algorithm that is capable of, of telling me that six months from now, uh, we are going to launch a new product, right? It simply doesn't know. So those things need to be entered by engineers. And what the way we do that is we use um, uh, cloud uh, uh, calculators, cost calculators, right? They, they, every cloud has AWS, GCP, uh, Azure, Oracle. Um, every cloud has these cost calculators uh, where you can in detail uh, build a bill, bill of materials, right? I need this many VMs. I need this many databases. I need this much data transfer. I need this much blob storage and so forth, right? Once you have uh, that uh, uh, bill of material compiled, the calculator will actually give you a cost. And that uh, cost number then for each month, because maybe you have a ramp up phase, then you have a steady phase. And you, if, if the service is only temporary, you will have a ramp down phase. So you need to model this um, over the months and, uh, you know, literally provide these numbers um, to the forecasting system so that the forecasting system can layer this in, right? Now, you mentioned that forecasting is important, and I want to go into a little bit more detail why it is so important. Um, if you're over forecasting, so you, uh, the forecasted number is more than your actual spend, that difference, your company was not able to use during that time period, let's say 12 months, right? So if you're off by like $5 million, that $5 million could have been used for other innovation, uh, some projects, marketing, sales campaigns, uh, you know, whatever. But that never happened because you forecasted too much. If you forecast under actuals, right? So your forecast is lower than the actuals. The actuals are over forecast. What happens is that this, this money uh, has to come from somewhere, right? Uh, so when you look at typical revenue uh, spend of, of companies like, you know, Apple, Amazon, um, Meta, those kind of companies, about half uh, is spent on headcount. About a third 
is spent on um, physical operations like offices, uh, physical security, janitorial, cafeteria, landscaping, that kind of thing. Then there's a, a relatively small sliver, maybe a sixth or so, that is sales, if the company has sales. And then you are left with a very small uh, portion underneath that is maybe about one sixth. And, and that is what powers the innovation for everything on this planet, right? Um, unless maybe you're NASA and you, you get just a government money, right? And, and you know, don't have to worry about that. But so that little sliver there uh, is where the innovation happens. And usually the cloud spend isn't that as well, right? So if you uh, actuals are come over what you forecasted, what happens is that uh, projects have to be, uh, that were in flight, right? They have to be put on hold. So let's say you had a sales campaign um, and the sales campaign uh, a marketing campaign and the marketing comes up with um you know maybe the first three months is a product introduction they show you how to use the product right uh, how to click on things or do stuff with the product now after that ramp up period there's maybe a a brand uh building period of another six months right during which you uh show the product everyone already knows how to use it and you just bring bring up the brand logo right and you see something like you know um uh, you know that's auto you know you, you have a catchphrase right that, and that tells you okay this this is now associated with the brand and then you may have a ramp down period if you pick the the a, a wrong spot during that uh, time period to end your campaign um or, or project or whatever effort you had the lead to that may be a complete loss to the company so again, we, we are looking at potentially several million dollars that you spent on something that has no effect. Uh, Dieter, what about some pitfalls? Okay, can we maybe touch on some of the common mistakes? Because it looks like, you know, the excitement about FinApps is growing. But what are the common challenges you want to warn people? You know, uh, uh, and I want to bring it back to engineers, right? What are the mm -hmm. common challenges for engineers? Um, and it is, again, uh, understanding uh, visibility into cloud cost, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of like a very fundamental, basic, uh, foundational capability, right? Understanding how uh, savings uh, uh, instruments apply to your cloud cost, when they apply, when do discounts apply, so that you can read your dollar number correctly, right? Um, then when it comes with innovation, um, uh, knowing uh, what the cost is, knowing what your budget is, having just general awareness around those things, right? Uh, looking at cost anomalies, right? Um, when when someone comes to you and says like, hey, you have some usage that wasn't there before, um, uh, take that seriously, right? Don't say like, oh, you know what? I, I have my projects going on. Um, I have my deliverables. I have my roadmap. I don't have time for this, right? Because if you are spending like $10,000 a day, uh, that's going to be uh, 300,000 at the end of the month, right? Uh, that is about how much your role uh, uh, compensation-wise costs, right? So um, be aware of that, right? Uh, pitfalls, uh, when it comes to do, uh, doing cost savings in the cloud, make sure you socialize your ideas, right? Um, come, come to me, tell me, hey, I'm about to do X, Y, Z, right? I, I, that happens to me every day. And I'm glad about that, right? Uh, come to me, ask me if this is a good idea. It might not be. It might be a fantastic idea, right? But we need to make sure. You don't want to just do something uh, without double checking, right? Um, if there is a FinOps practice already established at your company, you're in good shape, then the effect will be that maybe portions of a sprint or entire sprints may be dedicated to um, usage optimization, however that looks like. It uh, could be cloud parking, re-architecting, right-sizing, um, moving things to, to cheaper services, those kind of things, right? Um, if you don't have that practice established yet, uh, talk to your manager about that, right? Uh, because your manager may or may not have an appetite to act upon it, right? Um, if your manager does have an appetite, uh, in, in my experience, it needs to come top down, right? Um, it, the, the executives need to support um, FinOps. Uh, they, they need to allow for enough time, maybe 5%, 10%, or they just say, hey, you know what, this month, dedicated sprint. Or we have a FinOps hackathon, right? That is another, that's what we're doing at, at Roku, right? Uh, we just do hackathons and uh, we go and every engineer is like looking for stuff. Uh, very busy times for me with a lot of questions, right? 
So um, there is lots of different uh, things of how you can get involved in FinOps and can um, you know make a, a significant contribution in the cloud FinOps space. Huh, what about some gamification, Dieter? Do people I do that? that? I mean, any kind of award system, any kind of competitive angle to this? Have you yes, seen this? Uh, at Intuit, what we did is we built a waste dashboard. So mm -hmm. it basically calculates, this is your current cost. This is how the optimized cost would look like. Again, you get a difference, right? This is your current cost. This is your optimized cost. And the difference between the two, that's your waste. And we display that dollar value on the dashboard and we sort it by the highest dollar value on top. If you, and, and that is very useful, right? Um, but one of the first things that you will notice is uh, people will ask for exceptions to be implemented so that you can ask for, hey, I have this workload. This is a legacy application. Maybe it's running still on Windows servers or something like that, right? Uh, over the next two years, we don't have any plans of changing that. This is just something that we have to do right um so that in my experience that was the first thing the first feature enhancement of that uh waste dashboard is to um you know uh, have an exception process to that um another thing with the waste dashboard that you will see is that your perception of waste will broaden mm -hmm. um you know maybe you start with we call them waste sensors so maybe we start you start with like six big waste sensors right but then once you make some progress on that, maybe you add another six, right? Or another 12. Um, there, there is uh, on, in, in the FinOps Foundation uh, GitHub repository, I think there's something like 50 waste sensors, right? So as you uh, uh, grow over time, as you mature from crawl, walk, run, right? You will add those waste sensors, which also means that the dollar values, uh, the bar will rise. Right over time, maybe your waste was twenty thousand dollars in the beginning, and now it increased to forty thousand, or maybe to eighty thousand. Right, so the the bar will rise, and you need to communicate that to your uh, engineering leaders. Right, you need to say like, yes, it is increasing because we are adding more visibility into this area. Um, it's like you know uh, having a, a a stack of of papers and you take a couple of papers off there's more papers underneath it right you now have more visibility that's how that works thank you Dieter. thank you so very much time is flying we're a little bit over time so appreciate everybody who is staying with us please share please share a link to this event because it stays recorded all right we'll make sure that more audience will see will see the fantastic insights and hear wonderful experiences from Dieter. so please share with your network with your peers because again we are just at the beginning of the journey FinApps exactly. is really right the importance of discipline is rising next year it will be only bigger Dieter, in uh, um, in conclusion, please, right, few takeaways. You mentioned so many important insights for engineers, for finance, for pretty much everyone in an organization. Any, any takeaways to send our audience with? Yeah, so if you're an engineer and you want to get more involved in FinOps, right, um, uh, take a look at the FinOps book, right? That's certainly mm -hmm. um, helpful. There is going to be an, uh, a new version of the FinOps book uh, released, uh, uh, I believe, either next January or February. It's supposed to be January, but we are running late at the moment. So um, that will have uh, something like eight more chapters and uh, I believe 150 more pages. So if you can wait a little bit until, until that uh, book comes out, it's definitely very useful, right? Uh, then look at a uh, uh, Cloud FinOps Practitioner certification. Um, if you try to take the certification cold, uh, it will be difficult. I, I helped to build the questions and you really need to at least read the book or uh, attend the class. It's a two day class. It's like five hours a day or something like that. Right. If you attend the in-person class, um, which is unfortunately a little bit more expensive, you will have an extremely good chance of passing uh, your exam on the on the first attempt. Right. And generally, you know, become a FinOps practitioner, sign up with the FinOps Foundation um, and and go into their Slack channels, right? It's very extensive conversations that are happening. A lot of learnings that you can get for absolutely free without anything, right? Um, and uh, get more knowledgeable in that area. So that is my recommendation to you. Thank you, Dieter, so very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. Have a good one. Thank you for having me.